Western Russia, 1943. Vast German and Soviet armies clash in history's greatest and deadliest tank battle. The earth was trembling, as if there was a huge earthquake. 2,500 German panzers and assault guns face more than 5,000 Soviet tanks. By the time it's over, the casualties will reach more than 200,000. The gunners told me later that all they saw were gray walls. They were just firing and firing. The earth and sky were burning. This is the bloody Battle of Kursk. Tanks were on top of tanks. Soldiers on soldiers. Sheer terror. July 5th, 1943. Day one of Hitler's Operation Citadel. More than 800 German tanks roll across the Russian plain towards the town of Kursk. Waiting for them are the Soviets defending their homeland with the biggest tank army ever assembled. This is Hitler's final attempt at turning the tide of war on the Eastern Front. A war that for the last several months has been going very badly for the Germans. Since their disastrous defeat at Stalingrad in February of 1943, Soviet forces have been relentlessly battering the Germans, forcing them into a 180-mile fighting retreat back towards Germany. By the end of the winter, the German army on the Eastern Front is shattered and teeters on the brink of destruction. But Hitler is determined to reclaim the initiative in the East, and he makes plans for a massive counteroffensive. His plan is to launch a large-scale pincer maneuver to cut off the Soviet-held salient centered on the industrial town of Kursk. The goal? encircle and destroy the half million Soviet forces in the Kursk bulge. But the battlefield is huge. 200 kilometers long and 150 kilometers deep, most of it rolling farmland. In the wide open spaces of the fabled Russian steppes, it's ideal for tank warfare. It's a formidable objective and over the spring and early summer, the Germans amass two entire army groups, 780,000 men, close to 10,000 guns, and 2,500 tanks, an immense force that will shake Mother Russia to the core. But this buildup has not gone unnoticed, and as the Germans prepare for Operation Citadel, so do the Soviets. Now the enemy is gathering its massive power. He wants to gain revenge for their defeat in Stalingrad. So our commanders decided to regroup in the spring and regroup us in preparation for defense. Either we would attack right away or by defending, exhaust our enemy. To meet the impending German attack, the Soviets build up almost two million men, 25,000 guns, and more than 5,000 tanks. And all across the Kursk salient, they dig in. We had several lines stretching about 300 kilometers or so along the front. And the earth was so dug up. We had about 400 kilometers of trenches. The army and civilians did that, working on making anti-tank ditches, which tanks would not be able to get out of. 
and also in the places where the tanks were in danger of getting through, we made minefields. And that wasn't just in one place. It was almost along the entire length of the defensive lines. We had anti-tank guns, and they were amazing. And of course, tanks. The backbone of the Soviet armored corps is a T-34 medium tank. With a 76 millimeter main cannon, and 47 millimeters of sloping frontal armor, the 31-ton T-34 has a deadly balance of firepower, protection, and mobility. By the summer of 1943, Soviet factories have produced tens of thousands of them. And all across the Kursk salient, the T-34s move into position. July 5th, 1943. After three months of preparation, the Germans are finally ready for their attack. One hour before Operation Citadel is to begin, Soviet gunners unleash a massive artillery attack on German positions. All of a sudden, such a huge noise started, you could go deaf from it. The earth was trembling, as if there was a huge earthquake. The Germans were astounded. They never expected this from Russia. As it was dusk, it looked like fireworks. When the Stalin orgel exploded, the barrage was so intense, it actually destroyed the position. This caused lots of casualties right from the beginning. But something must have happened, as it was impossible for the Russians to figure the time of the attack, exactly one hour prior to the planned attack. But the Soviets knew the time of the attack to the minute. They captured a team of German sappers who revealed it under interrogation. The artillery barrage causes chaos in German lines and delays the launch of Operation Citadel. But only for one hour. Shortly after dawn, the Germans attack. A masses of tanks, about five, six hundred were coming. A horrid amount of tanks. The German tanks were advancing towards us. Each tank carried 20 to 30 devils, and all of them were drunk like shoemakers. And that's when all hell broke loose. The earth and sky were burning. Tanks were on top of tanks. Soldiers on soldiers. Armageddon. But we kept our word. No backing away, not even a step. For Stalin. By the end of the day, the Germans have made only modest inroads into the vast network of Soviet defenses along the Kursk salient. In the south, the German 4th Army's panzers advance only 20 kilometers while in the north, the 9th Army has fared even worse, with gains of only 10 kilometers at a cost of dozens of tanks and more than 1,000 men. So far, Operation Citadel is going nowhere. And now, Soviet forces along the northern shoulder of the Kursk Bulge prepare to counterattack. One hundred tanks from the brigade moved forward. Can you imagine a field, an open field, and you are driving towards each other? Whoever gets whomever first. Oh 
The enemy position had 50, 60 tanks. And in front of us, we counted 17 Tigers. The Tiger is the German Army's biggest tank. Encased in over 100 millimeters of armor, it is practically impervious to frontal attack. But it is the Tiger's 88 millimeter cannon, with a range of more than two kilometers, that makes it the deadliest weapon on the Kursk battlefield. and the horrible epic battle began. Half of our tanks were lightweight. They ran on gas, and they would burn up like candles. I'm sorry, but here you can't tell fan from food. I came out of the bushes from the battle, and behind me, the tigers were close. So I fired about two times at a time. Our tank had 76 millimeter gun. It didn't penetrate their tank. But our anti-tank unit was close by, and they finished him. We began destroying each other. losses, but the enemy had huge losses too. The Germans would come this way about four or five times. My lead was open, so I could look out and find the target. And in jumps the commander of my battalion. His tank got hit, and it burned out. Enemy infantry surrounded him. So he decided to hide in mine. And as soon as he jumps into my tank, I get hit. His head is just ripped off. I was drenched in blood. His brain, everything was all over me. As soon as you see the anti-tank gun pointed towards you, as soon as you can, just shoot and get him, or else you die. And I ran over all of them, along with their entire crew. And that's the kind of hell it was on July 6th. In less than two days of fighting, tens of thousands of men die on both sides, and the hulks of hundreds of tanks lie in the burning fields around Kursk. And it's only the beginning. The Germans now prepare to strike again. Their target, the small rural village of Ponnery, a quiet railway stop that is about to become ground zero in one of the bloodiest battles of the Second World War. July 5th, 1943. In an effort to change their fortunes on the Eastern Front, the Germans launch a massive armored offensive against Soviet defenses on the plains of Western Russia.
The objective of Operation Citadel is to encircle and destroy Soviet forces in the bulge around the industrial town of Kursk. The Soviets put up a stubborn defense against the advancing panzers. There are heavy losses on both sides, and by the end of the second day, the Germans have made only modest gains. Now more than a day behind schedule and determined to take Kursk, Field Marshal Walter Model launches a new assault. His target, the railway town of Ponnery. Ponnery is on the main line between Arel and Kursk, making it a central collection and distribution point for farms in the area. If Modal and his 9th Army are to take Kursk, they must first take Ponnery. But Soviet Field Marshal Konstantin Rokossovsky knows the strategic value of the town. He digs in with a massive force of tanks and guns and lays thousands of mines. Little Ponnery Station now becomes the most heavily fortified point along the entire Kursk salient. Through this field right here, with the forest as a backdrop, the German tanks were moving toward us, where we're standing right now. Behind the enemy tanks, the infantry march against the soldiers sitting here in these trenches. When Rokossovsky was preparing for this battle, he ordered the creation of three lines of defense. All three lines of defense were deeply saturated with troops. Within each, many rows of trenches. It had a defense line of sharp iron spikes. And of course, in between of the trenches and iron spike fences lay many, many mines. The artillery and tanks were dug into the earth. This is front of us is a dugout where tanks would be buried. Such dugouts we would call Kapanira. It contains three sharp walls and one flat entrance. The tank would drive into it so that its turret and main tank gun were level with the earth. The tank itself would be a little weapon against the enemy, and this particular territory found itself the very epicenter of the battle. The Germans and Soviets engage in a vicious seesaw battle for control of Ponnery. The town changes hands five times in a single day. The Germans send wave after wave of panzers into the fight. Many are destroyed by mines, T-34s, and anti-tank guns. On July 9th, the Germans attack northeast of the village, striking Soviet positions on high ground, designated on their maps as Hill 253.5. Our division, the Sturmgeschutz 177, joins the others on July 9th. We were supposed to attack a hill that was occupied by the enemy. We used assault guns, infantry, and one unit of brand new Ferdinand tank destroyers. The Ferdinand is Germany's newest self-propelled gun, never before used in battle. It's a 65-ton monster with 200 millimeters of protective armor plating and twin 300-horsepower engines that move it along at 30 kilometers an hour. But its most dangerous feature is its six-meter-long, high-velocity, 88-millimeter cannon. And we had big hopes for these tanks, which were able to shoot with their 88-millimeter cannons at a distance of 3,200 yards. The Ferdinand could not handle the ascent of the hill. We thought they had got hit by artillery. But after they caught fire, one after the other, we assumed that the engines were overheated and exploded. The crews got out and ran away. And once again, we depended on the Sturmgeschutz. The Germans' most widely produced assault gun is the Sturmgeschutz, or Stug. 
Built on a Panzer III chassis, the turretless Stug is armed with a high-velocity 75mm cannon and is Germany's most successful tank destroyer. The attack started when we drove across a minefield up the hill. The Russian artillery was attacking us like hell. Our commander was standing in the hatch to show us that we have to spread out. He got hit and was killed. One of the tanks got hit on one of the trucks and the truck flew off. Although they lose more than half of their Stugs, the German advance breaks through Rokossovsky's first line of defense. We fought our way across the first row of ditches and took the second row of ditches on the Russians retreating. There was a very narrow turn. And immediately behind it, there was a Russian anti-tank gun. Those who managed to escape were shot by the infantry. Shortly behind the next turn, there was another anti-tank gun. We could not react that fast. All I could call out to the driver was, hit it full throttle. July 9th, 1943. The Battle of Kursk enters its fifth bloody day, with the German 9th Army still unable to penetrate the Russian defenses in the northern sector. The Germans, desperate to complete their drive to Kursk, launch an enormous armored assault on the strategically important town of Ponary. Their goal, seize the high ground northeast of the village, known as Hill 253.5. We fought our way across the first row of ditches and took the second row of ditches and the Russians retreated. Shortly behind the next turn, there was another anti-tank gun. We couldn't react that fast. And all I could call out to the driver was, hit it full throttle. We drove towards the anti-tank gun and managed to more or less crush it. We managed to move forward quite far, and a tank appeared in front of me. A T-34 was approaching us fast. And we fired the first shot with the anti-tank shell. The shell bounced off and we were afraid that our shells might not have the power to destroy a tank at this distance. The T-34's 47 millimeters of frontal armor is sloped at a 60-degree angle 
enabling it to deflect oncoming shells and giving the equivalent of almost 75 millimeters of head-on armored protection. But the tank had been shocked and moved sideways. shoot it in the side, and it blew up right away. Our tank shells had the ability to punch through tanks. They only exploded shortly after piercing the tank's steel wall. Therefore, the destruction of the tank and its crew was guaranteed. By the end of the day, the Germans finally capture Hill 253.5, taking heavy losses, but inflicting worse on the Soviet defenders who fight to the last man. The German demons were aiming to have the Soviets panic and leave. But our soldiers, with our general's command, did not even shudder. We were not afraid. Soldiers didn't think about putting their life to an end. If they had to slide under a tank, they did just that in order to save Russia. The strategy of the Russian tank troops was, to put it like this, stubborn. Stubbornly, they were attacking at the same spot, over and over again. Although former attacks had been fended off and lots of tanks were standing on the field, burning. And the next wave followed, and the next one. No stepping back. Those were our orders. Before the battle, each soldier, each officer is the same. Forgive me, but everyone wants to live. And when the enemy started their attack, this is when the battle went on. Everything on fire, everything in smoke. Just like the old saying goes, as thick as the smoke in a crematorium. That's how it was in the war. There is a particular way of dealing with and battling tanks, which is the same for all tanks. Everyone had a goal of letting the tank come as near as it could to you and shoot into the most vulnerable places on the tank. There is no point in shooting into the head of the tank because it had about 100, 150 millimeters of armor. You always aim to destroy its sides. I would shoot at the tanks with armor-piercing shells. I would see that I hit the jump. But the missile itself bounced off and went upwards. What? In that time, the enemy tank aimed at me and shot at me. July 11th, 1943. It's been six days since Hitler's Operation Citadel began. And his massive panzer armies have made only modest gains. In the south, the German Fourth Army, spearheaded by three elite SS panzer divisions, has penetrated just 50 kilometers into the Kursk salient. And in the north, Modal's 9th Army has advanced only 20 kilometers towards Kursk.
In order to finally achieve a breakthrough, Modal prepares for one final attack and commits all of his remaining reserves, hoping to finally crack the stubborn Russian defenses at Ponary. Just like the old saying goes, as thick as the smoke in a crematorium. That's how it was in the Everyone had a goal of letting the tank come as near as it could to you and shoot into the most vulnerable places on the tank. There is no point in shooting into the head of the tank because it had about 100, 150 millimeters of armor. You always aim to destroy its sides. I would shoot at the tanks with armor piercing shells. I would see that I hit the jackpot. But the missile itself bounced off and went upward. In that time, the enemy tank aimed at me, shot at me, but didn't get to me. I managed to hide in the bushes. If I hadn't, I would have been destroyed. So I came out, and I was behind a burning Katyusha rocket launcher. I hid behind, I stopped, and I held my fire. Then I shot and got the tank in the side armor. You see the entire crew jump out. Once the tank was down and burning, the German tankers would climb out, and we would react right away. We'd kill them, so there the tank would be burning, and beside lay three to four dead bodies of German devils. After almost a week of intense fighting, the Germans are exhausted and battered, and they haven't even taken Ponary. But they've inflicted huge losses on the Soviets, who seem to have endless reserves of men and T-34s for the fight. The tanks drove against each other, and there was shooting everywhere. The gunners told me later that all they saw were gray walls and they were just firing and firing. During the combat, my steering had been damaged. When we couldn't move forward and steer. We had to drive backwards to steer instead. And of course, this was an immense handicap. And so I decided to drive back and gave notice to the command post that I was returning to the garage. While I was standing there, a T-34 came at us at full speed. I managed to drive backwards and get into firing position. I shot the tank and it started burning right away. I asked my comrades what had happened. They told me that the Russian tanks managed to break into the weapons and reserve coup area. The 
und haben es auch zum Teil geschafft. Und jetzt begann und now our tank battle started, the likes of which had never been seen before and will not be experienced again anytime soon. Und durchmachen müssen. What Bose and the rest of the Germans on the northern front are experiencing is just the beginning of a massive Russian counteroffensive, one that will determine the outcome of the Battle of Kursk and will ultimately change the course of the Second World War. The Battle of Kursk enters its second bloody week. The losses on both sides have been enormous. 80,000 men killed and more than 2,000 tanks destroyed. On the northern front, the Germans have lost 21,000 men and 50% of their armored strength. They have no reserve forces left. Modal is no longer able to attack. But despite even heavier losses, the Soviets are able to field more than 400,000 men, 15,000 guns, and almost 1,400 tanks. With these deep reserves, they launch Operation Kutuzov. We received reinforcements. Those units that were really out of shape from the battle and lost too many lives and equipment were released. We had a goal set for each division and regiment. The rest of us went on forward with the attack. That's when the enemy suffered heavy losses. And we started a new operation. It begins on July the 12th. Their aim is to smash through the largely undefended flank of Modal's 9th Army. This attack marks the end of Hitler's Operation Citadel and heralds the beginning of the Russian summer offensive. All of a sudden, I was standing in a lower area surrounded by bushes and trees and was observing the enemy's flank. After a while, I noticed movement on the other side. The tanks were approaching us. Then, all of a sudden, we heard this strange sound above us. The Germans are getting help from the air. In a desperate bid to halt the Soviet advance, they throw everything they have into the battle, including the battered remnants of their once formidable Luftwaffe. Stukas kam angebraus, flogen über uns hinweg. Dive bombers were approaching us unexpectedly and attacking the Russian tanks. You look up and see that he is dropping the bomb. You go inside the tank. Close the lid. And wait to see if you blow up or not. But when I came out of the tank, I used to have supplies on me. Some extra stuff, some extra armor. None of it was there. None of it was left. Like they say, as plugged as a chicken. The bombs hit the tanks. And created huge craters. The tanks fell into these craters and could not make it out. I wanted to turn as I saw a Russian tank in front of me, a hundred meters away. I headed backwards and all of a sudden we got stuck. We had hit a stump and the track spun. We were stuck and couldn't move forward.
bin sofort rausgesprungen aus dem Geschütz und habe angesehen, was da los war. Und habe I jumped out right away to check what was wrong and called out to my two crewmates as well. Und mit einer Axt haben wir dann mittelgroße Birkenstämme abgehackt und haben die dann untergesetzt unter das Geschütz, dass es höher kam. Und With an axe, we managed to chop up some logs and level the tank free. grew stronger and stronger, and we weren't able to hold the front. The infantry had been sent out, and from our Stug unit, there were only three, four, or five left fighting. And so it was impossible to withstand the immense pressure of the enemy and stabilize the new position. Operation Citadel, Germany's last Eastern Front offensive of the Second World War, is over. The Battle of Kursk ends on July 13, 1943, but the fighting goes on. Now it's the Soviets on the offensive. After the freeing of places where the German devils resided, after our bombing and bombarding of those places, all of his hiding spots, all of his camps were ruined, wrecked, and defeated. They begin a relentless pursuit and destruction of German forces that will continue all the way to Berlin. In eight days of fighting, over 200,000 men are killed or wounded, and nearly 3,000 tanks are destroyed. The battlefield is littered with the dead and with the smoldering hulks of German and Soviet tanks. But the true cost of the battle cannot be measured just in terms of soldiers and tanks. For the real price of war on the Eastern Front has been paid by every man, woman, and child. I remember all the tragedy. It was in what year? In 1943? That's when the Battle of Kursk was. Everything was destroyed. There was nothing left. That would hang our people. Everyone was dying. What can you say? The field? The entire countryside was filled with dead soldiers. Everything was ruined. From behind, you could hear lots of screams. Help! Mama! Don't leave us here. Take us with you. And I stopped and we loaded as many wounded men up on my tank as possible. I encountered lots of terrible things. What else can I tell you? There is so much to put it all into words. It was colossal. You can describe it. But it's lying everywhere. But with our spirit, we defend it, our motherland. 